Does it ever feel like politicians make huge promises to get your vote, only to break them as soon as they take office? Do you ever feel like nothing changes no matter who gets elected? If you answered yes, don't worry, you're not alone. The political system is designed this way to maintain the status quo. While it can get frustrating electing politician after politician, only for them to disappoint us repeatedly, we should also remember that the biggest changes in our country's history didn't come from politicians handing them down out of the goodness of their hearts. It came from massive marches in the streets, boycotts, and community organizations demanding these changes. We're gonna take a look at how we can do this again but first, we need to understand the true nature of our political system. A lot of people are angry right now because Joe Biden has already gone back on a bunch of campaign promises he made back in 2020. For example, he said that he would raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, only to then claim that he couldn't do it because of the non-binding opinion of a Senate parliamentarian who he's legally allowed to ignore. He said he would immediately cancel $10,000 of everyone's student debt. But now he's saying he has to see whether or not he has the authority to do that. He infamously promised $2,000 stimulus checks, which turned out to only be $1,400. Joe Biden railed against Trump's policy of detaining children in these migrant camps at the southern border. And what does the Biden administration do? Continue to use these camps and oversees a 15-year high in arrests at the border. And if all of that wasn't enough, they're now rebuilding Trump's wall. I'm not even kidding they're helping build the wall that they spent the last four years denouncing. It is, it is paused. Uh, there is uh, some limited construction that has been funded and allocated for, but it is uh, otherwise paused. While the sheer speed with which the Biden administration went back on all of these campaign promises is astounding, it's also not really surprising. After all, it's not like most presidents keep their promises. Just look at the last two. Obama campaigned on the slogan of hope and change and promised to end the wars, make government more transparent, make the economy more equitable, and build bridges with the Muslim world. But during his presidency, he inaugurated a drone warfare campaign against seven Muslim-majority countries, oversaw the largest troop surge in Afghanistan, toppled the government of Libya, and tried to do the same in Syria. He continued Bush's corporate bailout policies, which led to 95% of income gains going to the top 1% in his first term. He oversaw the NSA surveillance program and justified the prosecution of whistleblowers like Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning, and Julian Assange for exposing violations of privacy rights. In 2016, Donald Trump came along and claimed that he was the real change candidate and that he was a political outsider and a self-funded billionaire who answered to no one. Trump also opposed the wars, calling them wasteful. He promised to drain the swamp, end the reign of special interest groups in Washington, and even promised to raise taxes on the rich. But all he ended up doing was picking up exactly where Obama left off. While Trump slightly reduced the number of soldiers deployed in Afghanistan and Syria, this really reflected a shift in strategy to increase the role of drone warfare and decrease the role of ground troops. Trump became the new drone king, taking the title from Obama well before his final year in office. He also signed off on one of the biggest military budgets in US history. So much for cutting waste. And as far as draining the swamp goes, he basically drained the contents of the swamp into his executive cabinet. Trump's cabinet was packed with billionaires, Wall Street goons, and corporate CEOs, making his cabinet the wealthiest presidential cabinet in US history. So it comes as no surprise that Trump would go on to cut taxes for the rich by about $2 trillion, money that could have gone to fund things like education, infrastructure, and healthcare, which would have helped all of those average working Americans that Trump said he was fighting for. Trump gathered his rich friends at his private resort, Mar-a-Lago, and told them in a speech, you all just got a lot richer. In other words, Biden breaking his campaign promises is perfectly consistent with past presidents, regardless of party. But this problem also goes way beyond the presidency. It's actually a fixed feature of the political system. In a capitalist society, politicians and government institutions are for sale, just like everything else. Corporations and the ultra-wealthy are allowed to donate unlimited amounts of money to politicians through lobbyists and political action committees. Now, in most countries, paying politicians to buy political influence would be considered corruption and probably carry a hefty jail sentence. But in the United States, it's just called lobbying. 
Political donations give donors special access to politicians, and naturally donors use their influence to get politicians to pass laws that make the donors even richer and more powerful. If a donor asks a politician to pass a favorable law or cut certain regulations, it's almost impossible for that politician to say no. Because if they do, the donor will almost certainly stop donating to that politician and might even donate to their opponent. The pressure to satisfy donors is especially strong when it comes to big donors because if they pull their money, it can make or break a campaign. In 2020, around $3.5 billion was spent on lobbying. Washington recorded 11,524 registered lobbyists, which comes out to about 22 lobbyists for every one member of Congress. That's like 22 people offering each member of Congress bribes, gifts, vacations, and fancy dinners to write and pass favorable legislation. That's a lot of pressure. But if we really want to see how corporate America controls the government, we have to look at congressional committees. Congressional committees are where laws are written, debated, and rewritten. The final floor votes that we see on TV are really more for show. Everyone's already decided how they're going to vote beforehand. Let's take a look at arguably the most powerful committee in Congress, the Appropriations Committee. They decide how all the money is spent. So now we're gonna take a look at some of the donors to the Senate Appropriations Committee. So these are Patrick Leahy's donors. He's the chair of the committee and he's a Democrat. His top two donors are weapons manufacturers. Now, if we look at the ranking member of this committee, which is the second most powerful position, uh, which belongs to Richard Shelby, who's a Republican, we see the same two donors. Now, we're usually told that the Democrats and Republicans are two completely different parties, they have two completely different perspectives, but clearly the military-industrial complex sees them the same way, as politicians who can be easily bribed with money. If you've ever wondered why the United States seems to always be at war and has a military budget that's larger than the next 10 countries combined, it might have to do with these bribes. Lockheed Martin gets more government contracts than any other company, a whopping $50 billion for only $12 million worth of lobbying. Right behind them are Boeing, General Dynamics, Raytheon, all the other military contractors that make massive donations to the top members of the Appropriations and Armed Services Committees. Outside of weapons manufacturing, we see AT&T winning a billion dollar contract with the DOJ, Comcast received almost a billion dollars in federal tax subsidies. Both of these companies donate heavily to the appropriations, but also to the Commerce Committee, where AT&T and Comcast hired lobbyists to sway the direction of the Save the Internet Act, a law that would prevent ISPs from throttling their customers' internet. Pfizer, who we all know from their COVID vaccine, spent millions of dollars lobbying the CDC, FDA, as well as the HHS, the executive agency that awarded them the $2 billion contract to create a COVID-19 vaccine. How can we even consider this system democratic if weapons manufacturers decide our foreign policy, telecommunications companies block internet regulations, and for-profit drug companies bribe the very institutions that are supposed to regulate them? In other words, the very idea that people we elect to Congress or the White House are advocating for our interests is wrong. They're advocating for the interests of their corporate donors. In fact, a Princeton University study showed that regardless of how popular any piece of legislation was with the public, the chance of it passing was always the same, 30%. But when the study looked at the likelihood of a bill passing based on its support among the top 10% of income earners, data showed that the more popular piece of legislation was more likely to pass, which is the way it should be. To quote the study, the estimated impact of average citizens' preferences drops precipitously to a non-significant near-zero level. Biden is beholden to corporate executives and billionaires just like the rest of our government. He broke all of his campaign promises because he never intended to keep them. His only real promises were to his donors. They decided the real agenda of the Biden administration at private, off-the-record donor meetings. Here's a video of Biden entering one of those meetings. It was probably a gathering like this one where Biden told his rich donors that nothing would fundamentally change about the wealth distribution in this country. 
But even if you have a true grassroots candidate who isn't taking donations from any billionaires or special interests, everyone whose support they need to further their agenda does. And in an effort to maintain good relationships with these key decision makers, politicians trying to work within the system will avoid criticizing people in positions of power to the point where they become indistinguishable from the very people they were trying to challenge. So let me put it to you like this. If you saw your friend going to a casino all the time, betting on red or blue, over and over and over again, but you knew the dealer was loading the dice, wouldn't you tell him to stop wasting his time? So why do we keep going along with this rigged political game? The reality is, all meaningful social changes in society, like women getting the right to vote, the passage of the Civil Rights Act, the end of the Vietnam War, or the legalization of same-sex marriage, not one of these things came through political campaigns waged in the halls of Congress. In school, they give LBJ credit for ending segregation because he swiped a pen on a piece of paper. But it was really because the civil rights movement was so strong that Congress felt that if they didn't listen to the protesters' demands, they would lose their credibility, lose their elections, and possibly even force the protesters to resort to more drastic means of attaining their freedom. History shows us that the establishment only makes concessions to us when they're scared of us, scared of our numbers, not the letters we're writing them. When the Montgomery bus system was arresting black people for refusing to give up their seats to white people, people didn't wait until the next election to vote the racists out. They began boycotting the Montgomery bus system. Black people refused to take the bus, choosing to walk or organize carpools to get where they needed to go. This went on for 13 months. Imagine walking to and from your job every day for 13 months straight. Since black people were three quarters of the Montgomery bus riders, the bus system's revenue tanked and the segregationist policies had to be dropped. This wasn't an isolated event either. In the 90s, a very similar situation played out in Los Angeles where public funding for transportation was going almost exclusively to train lines that served wealthy white suburbs, even though most of the riders were working class black and Latino people that took the bus. A labor organizer and anti-war activist named Eric Mann founded the Bus Riders Union to attack what he called transit racism. The Bus Riders Union would prevent the driver from collecting fares from anyone who didn't get a seat. These tactics are used time and time again because they tap into the one power that the rich can never have, the power of numbers. The situation today is no different. I don't think I've seen politicians more responsive in my life than I saw last summer when millions of people took to the streets to protest the murder of George Floyd. I mean, when have we ever seen a mayor attend a massive protest and then get booed by tens of thousands of angry protesters when giving the wrong answer to their demands? Will you defund the Minneapolis Police Department? In a country where cops murder unarmed people and don't even get charged, it's hard to imagine that Derek Chauvin would currently be on trial if it weren't for these protests. After just a week or two of sustained protest, we saw the removal of Confederate statues, and city councils introduced resolutions to reduce police budgets and expand community control over policing. And most importantly, the uprising has ignited a national conversation about the role that racism has played in US history, which has shaped today's political climate more than any other political event. Beyond marches, we also saw people chaining themselves to the doors of eviction courts to prevent evictions. Renters across the country went on rent strikes. And during the widespread power outages in Texas, it was ordinary people delivering food, water, and warm clothing to people, while the federal government sat by and did nothing. Was this all enough? No, of course not. But it shows us what's possible. What kind of changes would we see if we saw another uprising? What if it was even bigger this time? What if the protest tactics evolved from just street marches to general strikes and civil disobedience? What if we created organizations in our own communities which could meet the people's needs without having to rely on the political system? Could the status quo even survive? 
Politicians have us knocking doors for their campaigns, donating our hard-earned money for them, as if we owe them something. They owe us something. They're public servants. They're supposed to serve us. So instead of going door to door trying to convince people to trust some millionaire politician in the suburbs, what if we went door to door recruiting our neighbors into tenants unions? What if we held meetings to talk about how to resolve conflicts within our own communities? What if we collected donations to start a food drive for the poorest members of our communities? Now, this is all, of course, much easier said than done. But then again, bringing about massive historical change was never easy. I mean, we're currently living through the worst recession since the Great Depression. There are unprecedented levels of poverty, inequality, homelessness, and war, not to mention a climate crisis that threatens the very survival of our species. So while building political power outside of the political system might seem like a daunting task, at this point, what do we really have to lose? <laughs>